coming up on The Code of Life. The four Ps right now are parasites, pathogens, pesticides, and poor nutrition. And I think that the fifth P should probably be predators, just because of all the news around the Asian giant hornet that has the been- The murder hornets. Yeah. That... There are other threats on the horizon that haven't hit Canada yet, haven't even hit the United States, but probably will. Welcome to The Code of Life. I'm Randy Neal. A recent article in Scientific American has suggested COVID-19 isn't the only pandemic affecting the world right now. Written by Alison McAfee, the article is titled, Honeybees are struggling with their own pandemic. It's something they've been struggling with for years now. Similar to human beings, they're also employing certain techniques to stay safe. Things like hygiene and social distancing. Sound familiar? Well, this pandemic is caused by something that kind of sounds like a character out of a Hollywood horror film. It's a parasite called the Varroa Destructor. But that's just one threat to the world's honeybees. Pesticides, pathogens, parasites, poor nutrition, and climate change, or heat caused by climate change and other factors are all threatening the world's population of honeybees. And scientists are using genomics to find out why how it affects them, and how to save them. Well, the study's author joins us now today, Alison McAfee, as well as Leonard Foster, a professor at Michael Smith Laboratories at UBC. Thanks so much, both of you, for coming out today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thank you. Let's talk first about an article that you both just co-published together um, this week in Nature Sustainability, and it talks about the dangers of heat affecting honeybees. Um, Leonard, it seems like Honeybees are under threat by so many, are under attack by so many different threats. Why did you guys decide to focus on heat in particular for this study? Uh, well, this actually arose with, through a collaboration with uh, North Carolina State University, where Allison is uh, appointed as well, and uh, led out of some work that uh, some of our collaborators had observed where the, the queens that had arrived after being shipped from um, overseas uh, didn't seem to perform as well as we would hope they would. Kind of following on what Leonard said, these queens, when they arrive and then they're introduced into colonies, then they will often fail. And to fail means uh, for her to start laying fewer eggs, fewer and fewer eggs, and then she can't support the population that's necessary for the colony to really perform all the functions that they need to to survive. So the population dwindles over time and eventually it'll die mm -hmm. unless the queen is replaced. So that can happen for a variety of reasons. And something that our collaborators found four or five years ago now is that failed queens tend to have lower sperm viability. So queens store all the sperm that they need for their whole life to fertilize eggs in their spermatheca, which is a specialized organ in their abdomen. And uh, he found that the failed queens had more dead sperm inside of them, so they couldn't fertilize so many eggs. And one of the reasons that they found also back then was temperature stress. So like you were saying, kind of honeybee one-on-one, -on -one, a, a queen can carry a, a, enough sperm to lay, for example, how many eggs? Uh, maybe around a million in her lifetime. I think that estimates her around 250,000 to 300,000 a year. So she could store the sperm potentially for up to five years as well, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, one queen per colony. So mm -hmm. how significant is that? Uh, well, a permanent change to the queen's reproductive capacity is a major decrease in colony fitness. Um, so she is the most significant individual in the colony. She's the one that everybody else kind of depends on to keep the population up. So if something happens to her, then the colony kind of goes into emergency mode and starts rearing a new queen right away. Um, and if they can't do that, then they're, they'll perish. How common is, is heat stress on, on honeybees? Uh, well, that was part of what the study was aimed at trying to figure out because uh, what we don't have a good handle on yet is uh, when we get a queen or if a beekeeper gets a queen from uh, someone who's providing them, 
uh, and it fails, we don't really know why it is failing. And, and does so, it typically fail? Is there a high failure rate? Is was that part of the impetus for trying to figure this out? It, exactly. Yeah, and and an inconsistent failure rate as well. Sometimes they were mostly fine, and then sometimes a large fraction would fail. Uh, and these early investigations led to the suggestion that heat stress was. Uh, one of the major causes of that. And this study that we just completed, uh, one of the main goals was to try to use proteomics to identify uh, biomarkers that we could use to actually diagnose whether something had been heat stressed or not. Prote proteomics. And that is? That is, uh, you mentioned genomics earlier. Uh, proteomics is a um, offshoot of genomics where we look at all of the proteins in a sample. If genomics is the study of the whole genome or all the genes in an organism, uh, proteomics is the study of all of the proteins that are derived from those genes. Uh, and if you heat stress, in this kind of an example, if you heat stress a, an organism, its genome doesn't change, but the proteins that are derived from that genome uh, could change and could show up as a diagnostic signature indicating some kind of stress. And uh, that's akin to a lot of the, the blood tests that someone might get if they go to a hospital and have blood drawn um, for any kind of disease. I did want to ask about something that does strike fear into some people's hearts occasionally. Those are genetically modified bees, for example, ever since genomics was really discovered as a science and, and we learned that we could learn more from genomics than we could learn about any other species before because of sequencing their genome. Um, there's also been a fear that we could create a, a Franken bee or a genetically modified bee, for example. Um, Allison, is are those fears valid? And is this something that we're trying to do? So scientists have actually already created genetically modified bees uh, using a couple different techniques. Back in 2014 was the first time it happened. So it's been in the realm of possibilities for a little while now. And I think that what people are worried about when they think about this is that some kind of company will start producing genetically engineered bees to, for example, be resistant to pesticides or maybe resistant to certain diseases or something like that, and then sell them back to the beekeepers, a lot like they have done uh, in the past with seeds or crops. And I think that uh, when I talk about this to people, I try to emphasize that there's no blanket answer of genetic engineering is good or bad. Um, it really depends on the specific context and the problem that we're trying to solve. So, for example, uh, I wouldn't think that it's a good idea to try to create bees that are resistant to pesticides, because when you think of the bigger context of what that would mean, then that would probably promote over application of pesticides uh, on cropland. And then all the other insects that are not privileged to this resistance would, uh, their populations could be decimated. So. Uh, we've seen similar things happen with herbicide tolerant crops um, in the past. So something like in that context, I don't think that's a very good idea for a practical application. But then an example, uh, another example where it may actually be the ethical thing to do would be in mosquitoes where people are trying to engineer mosquitoes to um, to not be able to reproduce. And so their populations will crash over time. And the motivation for that is because malaria kills around 200,000 people every year. So when you, in that context, then, you know, maybe that is a really good idea and something that's worth exploring. Leonard, I think um, to Alice, Ali's point as well, um, I think it was a study that you wrote when we were ta when talking about how bees stay safe and they do, use hygiene and social distancing. And wasn't it proteomics that helped you discover um, the, the hygienic bees and help beekeepers try to keep those bees healthy to keep an entire colony healthy? Yeah, so we didn't actually discover the, the hygiene behavior that had been um, well studied in the past. But what we did was to use this uh, type of genomics uh, technique called proteomics to identify differences in the proteins in hygienic bees from non-hygienic bees, and then use that signature to selectively breed for bees that had higher levels of hygiene. And 
there a big distinction is that we're selectively breeding from the natural population rather than trying to genetically modify uh, the the behavior into the bees, um, which as Ali said, is, is a long, long ways off. So let's talk about the other threats that honeybees, I mean, they, they have a tough time and they're still surviving. Um, but we call it the four Ps and, and Allison, you actually said it's possibly the, the five Ps. It's what what is it and, and, and what are all the different threats? So the four Ps right now are parasites, pathogens, pesticides, and poor nutrition. And I think that the fifth P should probably be predators. The reason why I thought of this was because of all the news around the Asian giant hornet that has the been- murder hornets. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So-called murder hornets. Um, they're really not so murderous, and that's probably an embellishment, that name. But uh, that got me thinking, like, okay, predators is probably a fifth P if this hornet establishes itself. But then I realized that we already have lots of hornets and wasps here that do decimate the colonies. I know a beekeeper we both know very well. She had 40% of her colonies perish one fall just a couple of years ago from yellow jacket wasps. So, And there are other predators of bees too, like bears. Canada probably yeah. loses more colonies to bears than um, Asian beekeepers lose to the Asian giant hornet. So, What is the biggest threat? Would it be the parasite, the Varroa destructor right now? Yeah, uh, worldwide. Uh, the... It's a little hard to get really accurate data, but generally every different jurisdiction agrees that that the parasite or the varroa mite is it, their largest cause of bee death. And is anybody studying that using genomics or proteomics to, to be able to maybe selectively breed a bee that, that is not prone to that parasite? So that, that was uh, to take you back to the hygienic behavior. Hygienic behavior, one of the uh, things that that defends against is the varroa mite. So that was part of the motivation there. Uh, there are a, a number of other uh, investigations into the mite using genomics as well, or d different aspects of genomics, including uh, looking for some of the signals that attract mites to bees and possibly being able to interfere with uh, that process to stop uh, stop the mites from breeding. And there's lots of fundamental science going into understanding the interactions between uh, the mite and the bee. And the mite, one of the reasons that the mite is so damaging is that it is a vector for viruses and the viruses themselves can be very damaging to bees as well. So there's there's a lot of work going into understanding those viruses also. How has genomics changed the way that we study honeybees? And I, and I want you to, to start with this, Allie, because I, I think <laughs> you didn't really know a life before genomics. You're, you're kind of post-educational um, life. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was kind of funny to go back in time and think about what I was doing at the time that the honeybee genome was sequenced. And I realized I was in grade 10 of high school when that happened. So, and so well before I started my scientific career. Um, and so I don't really know a life pre-genomics uh, right from the start when I got into research, that was the hot tool that was available. So um, I don't have a great perspective on how it has really changed <laughs> the field of research. Leonard? Uh, so I started in bee research when I was in grade eight or nine. Uh, so this was well before uh, genomics. And I, I guess I was really into serious bee research when I started university at SFU. Uh, and there, the only kind of molecular techniques we were able to use on bees were, was uh, methods for detecting the pheromones that bees produce. And uh, that was pretty much the extent of any kind of molecular work that one could do. Genomics changed all that um, with, in, in other model organisms such as uh, uh, flies or worms or mice, uh, we have a lot of tools for manipulating the, the genes or detecting proteins or, or genes that might be there. Uh, and none of those really existed in, in bees, but with genomics, uh, all of a sudden you're agnostic to what other tools might be available in that system and you can do all kinds of 
different kinds of experiments to understand the biology of the organism or applied biology as well in case of selective breeding or other developments like that that could be used um, in the field. I know that you were just telling me a story before we started this podcast about how you kind of came into the study of bees because you were worried that they were on the brink of, of collapse. That's something that the media has inaccurately portrayed about honeybees and you were schooled by Leonard. <laughs> what, did, what did you learn? Um, I learned that the story is a lot more nuanced than what I thought before, just from listening to uh, to the radio and watching the news. Uh, I went into research on bees thinking that they're, they were going extinct and soon realized that talking about honeybees going extinct is kind of like talking about chickens going extinct. You know, they are a livestock. Um, they are not going extinct, but their health has really declined. And that was sort of a major distinction for me as a new graduate student coming into this field is learning that uh, that the story is a lot more nuanced than I was kind of led to believe. And then most people are led to believe. So colony collapse disorder, all of those types of things didn't really threaten the world's population. Uh, well, colony collapse disorder, it depends on which side of the border you you fall on, but uh, it, it was a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to try and explain things that people didn't understand at the time. And in hindsight, we understand now that most of those losses that ha started happening in 2006, 2007 and have continued uh, are due to issues that we already knew about, the varroa mite being the, the major one, and, and there's uh, fungal pathogens and bacterial pathogens and there's weather-related uh, losses, other things like that. Uh, so as people started investigating things a bit more, we realized that most of the losses are actually uh, explainable. There was certainly a big increase in losses, and part of that, or that that's where a lot of the work has focused. Why did things change all of a sudden? And one aspect of that is probably that... Uh, the varroa mite started developing resistance to some of the chemicals that people use to control it. And uh, people didn't realize that in time to react properly. And so um, there were increased losses. But even now that we have new methods and, and understand that, we're still facing losses that are um, fairly high. Uh, so there's a this constant treadmill to try to keep ahead of um, all of the different health threats that honeybees face. And is this our new world? Do you think this will always be a constantly evolving race to keep our honeybees safe? Uh, it, it shows no sign of stopping. Uh, and there are other threats on the horizon that haven't hit, certainly haven't hit Canada yet, uh, haven't even hit the United States and some of the other um, developed economies, but probably will. Uh, so one of those is a another um, uh, parasite called Trophilelaps, which is really only in, in tropical types of uh, climates right now. And you can imagine with global warming that that could possibly uh, start moving across the world as well and, and impacting us here. So far, we, we don't have it in Canada. I'll just add to that too. They, they were first identified in the Philippines, but now those mites, triple A have moved into colder regions of mainland China and South Korea too, which do have cold winters kind of like we have in Vancouver. So um, with the climate changing, they'll, their access to different regions will uh, like different, different climate or different regions will be favorable for them to live in. Uh, but we know from where they are right now that they can tolerate the kinds of places in, that we would have in North America. So potentially another pandemic coming yeah. to hit our honeybees. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Let's end with your f most favorite fact about honeybees, your most favorite stat, or the, the thing that you love most about them um, and, and why they're so important to our world. A couple of stats, and either of you can hmm. go first. You decide. Yeah, I have to think about that. <laughs> How much do they contribute to our economy every year? 
is it five billion in terms of? Uh, yeah, and so in Canada, the estimates are between four to five and a half billion dollars, and uh, ninety-five percent of that is through pollination, and about eighty percent of that is through poll pollination of canola on the prairies, uh, and the rest is fruits and vegetable pollination. What's your favorite thing about honeybees? My favorite thing is the exquisite timing between when a queen dies and the timing that the bees, the, the small amount of time that bees have to start raising a new queen before they lose their last chance. So the queen lays an egg uh, that stays in that state for about three days. And uh, if she dies, the last egg she lays is going to hatch in three days. It takes the colony about a day and a half to two days to realize that the queen is gone. And they've got uh, that narrow one day window or so to find those those eggs that are remaining and start uh, raising a new queen out of those eggs or else, like Ali said, they, they could perish. I love how the women, the females do most of the work in the <laughs> colonies. Okay, what's your favorite, your favorite stat and your favorite thing about honeybees? I think that my favorite thing about honeybees or favorite bee fact maybe is that the queen is not the ruler of the colony. Um, like the colony depends on the queen, yes, but she is kind of a slave to the workers, actually. Um, and the she, workers are females. Yes, the workers are females as well. So Bee Biology 101, a colony has usually one queen, and tens of thousands of workers, and then maybe seasonally around five or 10% drones, which are the males. And the, so the workers are the vast majority of the population in a colony. And the queen is kind of a slave to them because her job, really her only job, is to lay eggs all day, one after another. She'll weigh one to two times her body weight in eggs each day. So she has nothing else to do. Um, and she's so busy doing that that she needs to be fed by the workers every 20 minutes. She can't even stop to feed herself. Um, and in that way, she's really not so much the leader of the colony. The workers kind of are. They do all the fascinating behaviors and they produce the honey that we love. One worker produces how much honey in its lifetime? I think that it's, the estimate is like a teaspoon. Yeah, about somewhere. five mils. Yeah, like less than a teaspoon, right? Yeah. And, and a worker lives only... Six to eight weeks in the summer. Yeah. yeah. So she'll live six to eight weeks in the summer here in northern BC or Alberta, where the days are longer. She'll survive for about two weeks because they're working like 20, really 20 hours a day. Yeah. Wow. We could talk about this forever. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's why thank it's you. so hard <laughs> I know, to <laughs> decide. <laughs> Allie and Leonard, thank you so much for your expertise and your important work. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.